poison. When alcohol enters the system, an enzyme, enzyme 1, immediately transforms it into a new substance which is even more poisonous than alcohol. But don't worry, there is method in the enzyme's madness. Because a second enzyme, enzyme 2, then has the ability to transform this new substance into a third substance which is completely harmless. But if you drink too much, or drink too fast, or drink the wrong sorts of things, or if your liver is damaged and isn't functioning properly, then enzyme 2 can't cope, toxins enter the system, and devastation follows. Tequila. Now, it's because alcohol is a poison that it's also an acquired taste. That's why, over the years, we've evolved mixers to make it more palatable. Lager and lime, gin and tonic, whiskey and dry ginger, port and brandy. <laughs> now, in, uh, in 1972, Kingsley Amis wrote this book on drink, imaginatively entitled Kingsley Amis on Drink. <laughs> and in it, he says, The human race has not devised any way of dissolving barriers, getting to know the other chap fast, breaking the ice, that is one-tenth as handy and efficient as letting you and the other chap, or chaps, cease to be totally sober at about the same rate in agreeable surroundings. <laughs> chaps, eh? Kingsley Amis, knighted earlier this year, and one of the great post-war British novelists. Also, an obnoxious old piss artist. <laughs> Famous for only hating two things in the world, women and everything else. <laughs> but he does know a thing or two about drink, and he's right. Alcohol does make us more convivial. But if we know that alcohol's a poison, and we know that it tastes so bad, then why do we spend so much time and energy acquiring this taste in the first place? Some people say that it's down to our parents, that we associate the smell of alcohol with our father coming back from the pub after a few pints, and starting to behave in a way we'd never seen him behave before. <laughs> Affectionately. <laughs> but of course, of course affection, affection is only one of the many stages that alcohol takes us through. So, what actually happens when you have a drink? Stage one, the first drink of the day. Alcohol enters the system and reaches the brain. You feel good. Not drunk, just convivial. Stage two, have another drink. Still convivial. You think, what nice people. <laughs> Stage three, hey, this is all right. Think I'll have another drink. Aren't there a lot of sexually attractive people in this room? <laughs> Stage four, what the bloody hell are you looking at? You start to get aggressive. Hey, no, 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 you're my best friend in the whole world. Then, over-sentimental. Then you start wandering off on long, convoluted sentences. But by the time you've got halfway through, you've, um... Stage five. <laughs> you've had enough. You know you shouldn't drink anything else. So you go on to the shorts. <laughs> Stage six. The walls and floors have started to move. But why be hidebound by social convention? Hands and knees are a perfectly acceptable way of getting to the toilet. <laughs> this is you at your best. Still feeling good, still feeling convivial. Unfortunately, you've just been sick on someone else's shoes. <laughs> the next eight hours will be a complete blank until you wake up the following morning with a terrible hangover. Now, most people presume that the first thought that you have on waking with a hangover is, never again. Not so. Never again is in fact a rather sophisticated concept that only occurs several <laughs> stages down the line. The first thought you actually have on waking with a hangover is, where am I? Who am I? Oh no, I'm, I'm still me. Oh, I wasn't me last night though, was I? No, it was somebody else entirely last night. Life and soul of the party. Dancing like a maniac till two o'clock in the morning in some trendy club. Me thinking I'm dead sexy. Everybody else thinking I must be somebody's dad come to give him a lift home. <laughs> if I had 12 pints of liquid to drink last night, then how come I'm still thirsty? 
<laughs> oh, where's the orange juice when I really need it? Where's the lemonade? Where it always is, downstairs in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> that means I'm going to have to move. And I, I'm afraid that's just not possible with a headache like this. What I really need to be able to do is snap my spinal column, rip my head off, <laughs> leave it behind on the pillow, get up, grope my way downstairs, Fill the way into the fridge, get the orange juice, sling it straight down the hole in my neck, back upstairs, into bed, lie down, screw my head back on, and back to sleep. Ah, but life's not like that, is it? That'd be too easy. Now, this isn't where you say never again, either. Well, it's a physical impossibility. Your mouth's all furred up like an old kettle, and the inside of your throat feels like somebody's been shaving it with Doc Cotton's rusty armpit razor. <laughs> so, you're going to have to get up and confront the day. First, check the room for any telltale signs of damage from last night. What about the bed? Are you sharing it with any farmyard animals? <laughs> or teenage runaways from foster homes? No? Good. There's just you and a pizza. <laughs> the reason you feel so bad the next day is partly because your internal filtration system has let you down and poisons have got through and partly because you are dehydrated. Did you have the two pints of water to drink last night before going to bed like everyone says you should? No, of course you didn't. <laughs> you didn't want to mix your drinks, it might have given you a hangover. <laughs> but along with the water, your system has also flushed out essential vitamins and minerals, such as calcium and potassium. Now, I'm not a doctor, well, to begin with, I'm sober. But I do know... <laughs> I do know that without calcium and potassium, you will feel, as my GP himself told me when I was researching the show, you will feel like shit. <laughs> There's also a problem with the brain. Last night, the brain was stimulated by the alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant, so in order to compensate, the brain has to turn itself up a few notches. The following morning, the brain remains stimulated. In this hypersensitive state, sound and light can be painful. The brain, in a state of cold turkey, needs to be let down gently. And here comes the good news. A small amount of alcohol will do that. So, it's time for the first drink of the day. The embarrassing one. When you walk into the pub at a minute past eleven and the hoover's still on. <laughs> the barman gives you a pitying look as he takes the last chair down off the table. Then you have to... You have to look him in the eye and say those embarrassing words. The pathetic cliché. The words he knew you were going to say from the moment you walked through that door. Those six sad words that tell this complete stranger everything he needs to know about your lifestyle. L large vodka and tomato juice, please, mate. <laughs> With all the bits, obviously. A Bloody Mary. This is good stuff. It really does work. The vodka does let the brain down gently. It's not just there, as I thought for many years, to take away the taste of the tomato juice. <laughs> <laughs> the herbs and spices are there to stop your mouth from tasting as if Oliver Reed died in it last night. <laughs> But here comes the answer to one of the great mysteries of the drinking kingdom. What is tomato juice for? Well, as chance would have it, tomato juice is crammed full of the potassium that the alcohol destroyed last night. And celery is also very rich in minerals. The ancient Romans knew all about celery. In order to ward off hangovers when they went out on drinking sprees, they used to wear garlands of celery round their necks. All very well for the ancient Romans but they didn't have to get the last bus home on a Friday night dressed like that, did they? <laughs>